Hi there. Thank you for joining me for this fifth session of the Medical Assessment of Impairment. My name is Roger Pillema and I'm an orthopaedic surgeon with a particular interest in impairment assessment. In past talks we have been discussing various medical and impairment issues that have been raised at our regular meetings over the years and I would like to continue to do so. Now at the end of the last talk I asked whether you could explain the mechanism of the deformity in an ulnar claw hand. This is the picture of an ulnar claw hand in a low ulnar nerve lesion showing extension at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint, that is the MP joint, and flexion at the level of the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints, that is the PIP and DIP joints. Before you can explain this deformity, you need to be aware of two different principles. Firstly, the difference between balanced and unbalanced paralysis, and secondly, the function of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Firstly then, the difference between balanced and unbalanced paralysis. Say for example, a person has a complete lesion of the radial nerve in the upper arm that is not treated. That person will lose the extensive function of the wrist, resulting in a wrist drop and eventually a deformity due to the unopposed action of the wrist flexors. That is an unbalanced paralysis. So unbalanced paralysis leads to deformity. Say the person has a brachial plexus lesion with loss of function of both flexors and extensors of the wrist. This is now a balanced paralysis which leads to flailness. So unbalanced paralysis leads to deformity while balanced paralysis leads to flailness. Now the treatment for each of these conditions is very different. If one has an unbalanced paralysis with deformity, the treatment is to transfer one of the flexor tendons of the wrist to the extensor tendons to give some extensor function. On the other hand, if one has a balanced paralysis which leads to flailness, the treatment is stabilization, either externally with a splint or internally with an arthrodesis or fusion of the wrist. So, if we have an unbalanced paralysis, this leads to deformity and the treatment is tendon transfer. On the other hand, if we have a balanced paralysis, this leads to flailness and the treatment is stabilization, either external or internal. That is the first principle we need to understand, namely the difference between balanced and unbalanced paralysis. The second principle is to understand the function of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. This is well shown in this slide that the intrinsic function is to cause flexion at the MP joints and extension at the IP joints, remembering that the intrinsic muscles of the ring and little fingers are supplied by the ulnar nerve. It is important to realize that the long flexors do not have any direct effect on the MP joint and that flexion of the MP joint is affected by flexion of the DIP and PIP joints in a roll-up fashion so that when the fingers are extended there can be no roll-up action and the only way one can flex the MP joints is via the intrinsics because the roll-up is not possible with fingers extended. So the only way one can get flexion at the level of the MP joints when the fingers are extended is via the intrinsics. Once again, showing the deformity in the ulnar claw hand with extension at the level of the MP joint and flexion of the IP joints. So let's see if we can now explain the deformity in the ulnar claw hand. Concentrating first on the MP joint and remembering that the intrinsics cause flexion at this joint, when one has an ulnar nerve lesion and loses the function of the intrinsics, there is loss of flexion at the level of the MP joint while there is still active extension. So one has an unbalanced paralysis which leads to deformity in favour of extension. At the level of the PIP joint, the long flexors are still functioning, whereas the extensors, that is the intrinsics, are not functioning, leading to a deformity in favour of flexion. And the same thing happens at the level of the DIP joint. So here again is the deformity in the ulnar claw hand with unbalanced paralysis at the level of the MP joint leading to deformity in favour of extension and unbalanced paralysis at the level of the PIP and DIP joints leading to deformity in favour of flexion. The second question asked was what do you understand by the term ulnar paradox? Here we need to consider the difference between a high and a low ulnar nerve lesion. In the low lesion that we have been discussing, the function of the long flexor tendons is preserved, leading to unbalanced paralysis at the level of the IP joints, which in turn leads to deformity in favour of flexion, as we have discussed. 
However, in a high ulnar nerve lesion, the nerve supply to the long flexors of the little and ring fingers is cut off, and therefore, instead of an unbalanced paralysis at the IP joints in favor of flexion, we have a balanced paralysis which leads to flailness rather than deformity. So the deformity looks less noticeable. So in a high ulnar nerve lesion, the deformity is less than in a low lesion, whereas one would normally expect the opposite, hence the paradox. Remember, however, that the function in a high lesion is worse than in a low lesion, even though the deformity looks less, because in a high lesion, one loses the function of the long flexors with much greater weakness. When we talked about the treatment of balance paralysis, which leads to flailness, it was suggested that the treatment was stabilization, either by way of external splintage or internal fixation or arthrodesis. As you may recall, AMA5 refers to ankylosis rather than arthrodesis. In orthopedics, we clearly distinguish between these two terms, and it is worthwhile spending a few moments clarifying the difference between them. Arthrodesis is derived from the Greek, arthro being joint, and desis meaning binding together, that is, the stiffening of a joint by operative means. The surgeon will remove all the remaining cartilage lining the joint, and then provides some form of internal fixation to hold the joint immobile until a fusion occurs. A successful osteodesis is pain-free. Ankylosis, on the other hand, means a stiffening of the joint as a result of a disease process or injury without any surgical interference. And there are two types of ankylosis with either a bony or fibrous union across the joint. A bony ankylosis will have the same effect of an arthrodesis and will not be painful whereas a fibrous ankylosis, even with minimal movement, can be very painful. If the fibrous ankylosis is very firm, it might be pain-free or minimally painful. So an arthrodesis is a surgical fusion and non-painful, whereas an ankylosis can be either bony, which is equivalent to an arthrodesis and non-painful, or fibrous, which can be very painful. Remember that even though an arthrodesis or bony ankylosis is not painful, the fusion can place additional stress on surrounding structures or related joints and can therefore still cause pain. So for example, a spinal fusion at L5-S1 is well known to place excess stress on the L4-L5 disc, which may then become painful. Here are some examples of arthrodesis of the knee, of the ankle and a triple fusion and of the MP joint of the great toe. A couple of examples of bony ankylosis here are both knees with no evidence of internal fixation and where one can see the bony trabeculae extending across the joint. And a bony ankylosis of the subtalar joint again with bony trabeculae extending across the joint. Before we end, let me give you something to think about uh, before the next session. There are many cases written up in the literature of patients with complete axillary nerve lesions who have lost total function of the deltoid muscle with marked wasting and who occasionally have a full range of movement and a very good function. Can you explain how this could possibly be? Once again, thank you for your attention and I hope that you will join me uh, for the next session and until then, Salani Gashleh.